So this is a nice original Johann's clock that was shipped to me by Martha Mitchell from Texas. It's a family heirloom that was given to her mother, Martha Boston, by a Mr. McKee, who was a rumor at her grandparents' home in Independence, Kansas, in 1943, where she and her mother lived because her father was in the war. Martha was about three years old at this time. Mr. McKee's mother brought this clock from Germany to the United States when she immigrated here. At one time, the clock was in the care of Martha's dad after he returned from the war. He didn't like the chimes, so he disabled them by removing the chime mechanism. So taking a close look at the dial, it looks like it's going to need to be restored. I'll talk to Martha and see if she wants to preserve it or, or restore it. If we restore it, we're going to need to remove all the old silvering and all those scratches and dings and then apply a new silvering on it. Get these chimes out of here. And this has some uh, writing on there. It says U.S. Patent, 1904. So, Johans apparently bought their chime assemblies from the United States. It looks like it's made out of bronze. Looks like this uh, piece of wood is broken. On here. But we will fix that up. We'll get this over on the bench and take a look at it. So taking a closer look at this uh, Johans movement, the pendulum, over 50% of the gold gilt has, uh, is worn off the pendulum. And you can see where it's shiny is where the gold gilt is. And then where that reddish dark brown color is uh, the exposed brass. And the movement itself, uh, at one time it was a nice gold gilt movement, but you can see here where the brass has been uh, exposed here, it's tarnished real heavily. There seems to be a lot of micro scratches in it, all, almost as if somebody had cleaned it with a, a rag that has some sand on it or something. It's just a whole lot of scratches in it. Uh, and, and here we have a lot of brass exposed, and it's, it's, it's heavily oxidized as well as up here a lot of exposed brass Let's see what the front side looks like front side uh, pretty much looks the same a lot of exposed brass uh, the gold gilt is pretty heavily damaged on this movement uh, yeah, just a lot of scratches r real deep scratches And also on this movement, there's some missing pieces. Now, Martha told me that when she was a child, this, this clock was given to her by uh, a boarder that was staying in the grandparents' home. And she said the boarder uh, ended up completing his job assignment and moved back home. And he left this clock for her. And she said she remembers listening to it chiming all the time. The chiming mechanism has been lost. And it, it would have went right, right in this area here. Uh, there would have been several hammers on this rod here. It's got one uh, remnants of a hammer and it looks like somebody has taken some electrical cord pins and soldered them together and mounted that on, on this hammer. That doesn't belong at, at all. She was hoping to get this uh, movement restored. We're going to need to find a parts movement in order to get these these parts that are missing. So the next thing we'll do is uh, see if we can locate some parts or, or locate a parts movement. Uh, this particular one is an A13. From what I've gathered, A uh, denotes the first six months of the year, and 13 would have been uh, 1913. So this particular movement was produced in 1913. We'll see what we can do about locating a parts movement or locating some parts for that missing mechanism. And on the front here, it's also missing uh, part of the winding mechanism right in here. It would have been identical to this piece right here. 
So we've located a parts movement so that we can get that other movement working. You can see this has the chime cylinder and the, all the whole chime mechanism, all the hammers. Uh, and the gold gilt on this movement in, is in a lot better shape than that than the other movement. As far as the age of the movement, I'm told that this eight Point fourteen means August of 1914 that this was produced. So one year later than that other movement. Let's, let's take a look at the front of it. This is a 100% uh, intact movement. It, it has the winding assembly that's missing on the other one. It looks as though someone has uh, reworked this movement. It has uh, bushings in a lot of the pivot areas. I'm not sure what's going on here, but I see some scarring on the on the front plate here. Or I guess that could just be some grease. It's almost like there's some a pin or something has been bent here. This uh, parts movement uh, is much cleaner than the original. It does have the uh, the mainspring in this barrel is not winding, so it's either broken or it needs a new hook put on it or something. We'll have to open that up and see what's going on there. But all in all, this is an excellent looking movement. It's not all scratched up like the original one. Looks like it has been maintained a lot better. So I talked to Martha on this uh, this parts movement uh, versus the, the original one. And because this one here is, is all intact, and it's a running movement outside of the mainspring for that one chime side. Uh, she's decided to go ahead and use this movement, and then we'll save that one that came out of the case in case uh, somebody in the future wants to, you know, rebuild it. Or But right now it just seems more economical to go ahead and just use this movement here. It'll be a direct replacement. So I'm going to go ahead and start dismantling this and, and get it cleaned up, get it oiled, and, and get it in that case. So I've got the mainspring out for the chime side. Uh, this is the one that was not winding. I had a br either a broken spring or something else was going on. And what I found was the loop on the inside is just uh, not connected. So that'll be an easy fix. We'll just have to shape this so that it fits that arbor. As you can see, that's what it was doing. It was just spinning in there. Pull the rest of the movement apart and see if it needs anything else. This is the chime mechanism. So I've got this movement all cleaned up, back together. Ended up cleaning this movement by hand. It's got a, uh, a lacquer finish on all the brass parts. And using the ammoniated uh, cleaning solutions will strip the lacquer off the brass. I didn't want to strip the lacquer off. And, and also using an ultrasonic will strip the, the lacquer off. But all the parts looked uh, to be in excellent shape. I didn't need to put any bushings in. All the pivots were polished nice. And uh, Somebody at one time or another has uh, completely rebuilt this. It's got bushings in almost every pivot uh, point. So I've got the mainsprings all pulled out and, and cleaned. Just go ahead and lube them up now. And they just take three, three uh, spots of oil on them here. And then once the mainspring winds up, it will equally distribute that oil.
it's time to remove this dial off of here. And it looks like uh, everything is going to have to be re-silvered. The old silvering is pretty heavily damaged and aged. A lot of scratches on it. Get behind it and push on it. It doesn't look like the nails are, are being held in by much. It's just got five fasteners. Uh, one, two, three, four, and five. And they're just little nails that have been driven in there. So I can get behind this dial and push on it. Get it to push out. So looking at the fasteners that was holding the dial on, what I'm finding here is some of these, even though they look close to each other, none of the nails match up with each other. They're all different. We've got some brads here with heads on them, and then these two over here are just uh, standard finish nails. So it looks like somebody at one time or another has had that dial off, and when they replaced it, they, they replaced it with a bunch of mismatched fasteners. So definitely that dial has been off before. So when I replace that, I'll make sure that all the fasteners match each other. And then the dial is going to need completely restored. This outer trim uh, has a couple bends in it. This bend here is not allowing it to contact the uh, dial plate. I'm going to see if I can bend that back a little bit. If the metal's stretched, I won't be able to get it to go back, but we'll see what we can do about getting that bent back where it's supposed to be. And it is brass, and the silvering is wore off of it, so I'll be resilvering this piece. And these two rings here will, will need to be resilvered. And the chapter ring, uh, it looks down here, it looks as if it was uh, possibly fabricated by or fabricated for. It says KC Company Germany. And this KC Company Germany actually stands for the Cruel Clock Company of Chicago and Germany. I'll see if I can zoom in on that little signal. And the chapter ring has the words KC Company, Germany, printed just below the six. This is actually the Cruel Clock Company of Chicago and Germany, spelled K-U-E-H-L. The company was started by two brothers, George and Theodore Cruel, in about 1891, and they actually sold many types of clocks. They also owned the George Cruel Cuckoo Clock Company in Germany. And sometime in 1909, they started using the inscription KC Company. Company, Germany on the dials, which is the same as this one. The company went out of business in about 1925. We'll go ahead and get these rings off of here. Interesting. This almost looks as if uh, it was made from a piece of metal that had some other another stamping on it. It's got some embossed letters on the bottom, on the back side of it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what those letters would have said. But we've got an S, H, and uh, a few other numerals on there. Let's see what the other one looks like. Now this back uh, dial pan, I see some rust on it, so this, this dial pan is actually steel, and the only way that I know how to silver plate steel would be to first plate it with a, a copper or a brass, and then plate the silver on top of the brass. So I may have to make a new brass dial pan for this in order to get the silver on it. Take these little pins off. Try to be as conservative as I can when I'm bending these because the more you bend them, the more they're going to want to break. And these little rings, 
they are uh, out of steel as well so we'll just go ahead and be able to clean those up we won't be able to silver uh, plate those not sure what that black is a lot of oil on there looks like the movement was over oiled well we'll go ahead and start the process of resilvering these so I'm in the final stages of cleaning this chapter dial up and what I do is I take these dials and I use some double stick them tape and tape them down to a nice piece of uh, flat piece of wood uh, in this case here it's a high density particle board and then I just usually start out with like 400 grit wet and dry sandpaper and just put a nail in the center here and just take a block of wood with a hole in there and then use lots of distilled water and then start sanding until we get all the silvering off and this dial has a few scratches uh, here's one right here that I may have to leave because I don't want to go too deep with these and This is the basic process, and while I'm doing this, I'm flooding this with distilled water to wash away any of the, uh, the brass particles. And then once I get it this far, I'm going to go over it with, uh, depending on what type of a finish on there. This had a, a brush finish, so 400 grit would probably be enough, but I could go to 600 and then 800 and even 1,000 to get a smoother, uh, less of a brush look to it. But after I get it all sanded here, I'll go ahead and dry it off with isopropyl alcohol, and then it's ready for the silvering compound. So I've got this fast slow ring cleaned up, ready to uh, put the silvering compound on it. Silvering compound is nothing more than like a silver nitrate or silver chloride. There's a lot of different companies that sell it, and you can make it yourself. I use cotton to apply the, the silver nitrate. And the silver salts will combine with the copper that's in the brass and it'll turn it to a, a silver color. And once the silver nitrate's applied, we'll go ahead and rinse that off and then we'll apply some cream of tartar. So that turned out real good. I'm going to go ahead and apply some cream of tartar. And I, I rubbed that on with a, a little cotton swab. Cream of tartar will make it shine a lot better, and it also neutralizes the acid that was in the silver salt. Okay, it's time to clean this off and move on to the next step. So I've got this fast, slow dial ring all silvered and have the uh, silver neutralized. The dial in this particular piece was in real good shape, but I'm still going to go over it with some shellac. I'm not going to be using what they call a wax in there. I'm going to be using a shellac based uh, paint or, or ink you might call it. I'm using this here uh, Windsor Newton ink. It's black India ink. If you're going to buy it it's a 951 black Indian ink and what it is it's a shellac based ink or you might call it a shellac paint. They uh, they thin it down real thin so that uh, you, you could call it ink but it's basically a shellac paint and since the dial uh, wax was in good shape I'm just going to refresh it with this shellac. Dial wax is nothing more than a shellac stick. It's a shellac that's got some black pigment mixed with it and I just need a very small thin amount of uh, black shellac in here just to kind of freshen it up a little bit. And if, if any uh, runs over the edge, just take a soft cloth and and since this is a shellac, it's waterproof, so I'm just going to go through here and this will freshen up the, uh, the color, the, the black on it. Then any of that get that gets on the surface, just take a damp cloth. 
rub over it and cleans, cleans it up real nice. Uh, once this dries, it's uh, it's waterproof because it is a shellac. So just take this uh, detail brush and freshen up those letters. Then a damp cloth. There's an area right here that's kind of light on it. And So now I'm going to be applying the silver salt to the chapter dial. And I'm just applying the silver salt with a cotton swab. So I've got the chapter ring silvered and now I'm going to apply the cream of tartar. I use the cotton swab for this. So this cream of tartar has been applied, it's time to rinse it off. So the chapter ring is all silvered and it looks real good. Now I just need to go over the numbers with some black shellac.
So this dial pan is made out of steel and it looks like it may have been plated with copper and then possibly brass plating on top of the copper. But because it does have a brass plating on it, I was really reluctant to sand through that the original silver and, and get into the brass because I don't know how thick that brass is. So what I've done is I've used some abrasive cleaner on it to clean up that brass that was oxidized. You can see where that chapter dial was, where it fits on there. The silver is in very good shape there, but any place where it was exposed, like the center here, it's fairly, it's quite degraded. But I cleaned it well well and I, I used some uh, some acid base cleaner on there to get rid of the tarnish that the brass had on it. Now I'm going to go ahead and apply the silver nitrate and see if we can't get some of that brass to uh, take on some silver. And if this doesn't work I may end up removing that silver plating on there and see what I can do about not damaging the brass too bad. And if all else fails I'll just go ahead and make a new brass dial pan for it. So it's time for the cream of tartar. So next item to work on is this inside trim and it is brass so I'll be able to take this down to the brass if I want to and then build the silver back up on it. The one problem this has is that it's warped and this piece of paper you can see it slides right in there and even right through there there's a, a pretty good warp right in there. Where it's warped the worst is this direction and this direction. I can take this drill plate and and pass it right through through there and also under there. That drill plate actually measures uh, 69 thousandths. So that's quite a warp on that piece but I'll go ahead and work on this and get get that so it's not so warped best I can. It's not going to be perfect. And then we'll remove that silver plate on there and re-silver it and then just move forward from there. So when I was taking this, this trim piece off, piece of wood fell out of the top of it and they had this piece of wood in here as a shim up there. Every place where they had the nails there's a shim here and a shim and a shim here and a shim here. This shim here fell the glue came loose and fell out so I'm going to go ahead and replace that get that glued up in there
Next item that needs to be addressed on this clock is the, the back door. It's real loose. just looks like it needs to be glued up and tightened up. Uh, Some place along the line somebody has uh, put a piece of cardboard on here as a stiffener. I, I think they may have put that there for. But that doesn't belong on there. And So I'm going to remove that cardboard and see what's going on in there and tighten that door up so it's not so loose on there. So what I'm finding on this door is somebody in the past has glued this piece of cardboard on here. I believe they glued it on as a strengthener and they've gone in the corners here and they've uh, put some sewing needles in here for, for nails and they've also taken some uh, needles and cut them off and put them in, in the corners of these miters. I assume they must have had uh, they must have had a problem with the door being loose. You can kind of see how loose that is. But this uh, this latch has two metal plates on the back side. And they're right underneath this cardboard and those metal plates are loose. Each corner has a wood spline in there and it's, it appears that the wood splines are loose or broken and somebody has come along here at a later time period and attempted to repair them by putting in these cut off needles in here, use them as brads to uh, kind of strengthen the corners up, but it's not strong enough. I can probably separate this right here right now except that the cardboard is glued on there. And then they've also got uh, sewing needles. Oh, there's one right there I just pulled out. And you can see it's just the tip of a sewing needle that somebody has cut off and they've used that to fasten the corners of the cardboard. And I also think that these uh, cut off needles might be going through the splines that are kind of weak on there. Here's one here that's hanging through. I might be able to pull it out. Yeah, that's just a, a needle that's been cut off and put in there. It's definitely an afterthought on trying to get this door fixed. But I'm going to remove that cardboard and get those metal plates on that latch uh, secured. And then I may have to put some new splines in the corners or just get some glue in there and get it clamped up. But, uh, no, that shouldn't be that loose in there. So I've got the cardboard removed off the back, but the reason the latch is so loose is because all of these fasteners, uh, this is a, a nail with a head on it. This looks like a finish nail, really small brads. And these are nothing more than needles that have been cut off and inserted in, in there. But these are all, they're all just uh, so loose that they can be pulled out with tweezers and that's that's why the latch was so loose so if I want to use these same fasteners I'll have to plug those holes to make them a little snugger and then uh, put those back in normally what I've seen is on these plates like this where they have uh, really short fasteners like this they'll run the fasteners long enough to come through this other side and then peen them over they didn't do that on this one. And also the wood has, has shrunk in here and it's pulled itself away. And on the corners, these splines that were originally put in there, they didn't really give a whole lot of uh, surface of the wood after the saw blade was cut in there. And, just, and this piece of wood here is just paper thin. And you can see where it has broke out. Uh, here's part of the original wood that has been broke out here. And, 
the splines were actually, I suppose their saw blade was a little too thick because they just didn't leave enough material there to be structurally sound. And so after they put their spline in there to hold it there, they, they put these little needles, cut off needles in here to hold it. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking that these uh, pins and needles used to hold this together are, are original. Uh, I'm not sure if that cardboard was original. May have been. And I see some writing here. I can't quite make out this writing, but it, it is uh, printed on there with a, uh, with a manufactured uh, typeset. Uh, it kind it kind of looks like G O N G K O, and then there's a couple letters I can't quite make out. Looks like there's about five letters through here that I can't quite make out, and then under it, uh, it almost looks like H E T T C H or H E T K C H, and I can't quite make that out either. But I don't know if that's uh, German or just what what that is, but it's surely not English. So to strengthen this this door up so that it's serviceable, I'm probably going to come in here here on each of the corners and uh, either run a, a hardwood dowel through it here or put a pin through it on each corner. And then after that, I will take this panel and re-glue it in there to make it more secure. And none of the miters are, are tight. They're all loose. The only way to crack that is to recut them because they weren't either the wood shrunk or they weren't cut at a true 45 degree angle. But we'll go ahead and leave those the way they are. We'll try to get this strengthened up so that it's serviceable. So I'll take this door out to my wood shop and get it strengthened up so that it's serviceable again. So I've got this back door restored, much more stable now. And as I mentioned earlier, there's some writing up here. It's stamped on there with a rubber stamp. I'm not sure if that's a stamp from where it was purchased new or whether that was maybe the case maker. Uh, Martha did mention that the man that gave it to her said that this clock had been brought over from Germany by his mother. But as far as I can make out, those letters read, uh, I'll try to get a close-up on those letters but I don't think they're going to show they're quite faint and right here it looks like a G O N G K O and then there's about four or five other letters here I can't read and down here it looks like it says H E T K C H or it could be H-E-T-T-C-H. -T -T Not sure, it's just so light. But since there is lettering on this, I don't believe that that cardboard on the back was original. I think I believe that was put on there by somebody else that maybe did a, a restore of it years ago. But I'll go ahead and get this on the clock now, and at least it'll be a serviceable door without it bending back and forth as somebody's trying to use it. So the movement's been working just fine for a couple weeks now, and it's time to install it in the case. I thought I'd go over a few things on the back side here before I put it in there and get everything covered up. This is the cylinder for the Westminster chimes. And then this bar over here is for the ch chimes for the hour. And I'll run this through. This is going to go for the quarter hour. And then for the half hour. and three-quarter hour and for the top of the hour Now if for any reason somebody wants to silence the Westminster chimes, you can do that from the front and you can see it lifts the hammers away from the Westminster chime drum. 
So now when I rotate this to the quarter hour, no more hammers will be moving. And if for some reason the chime sequence gets off for the Westminster chimes, there's a lever on the side over here. You just gently pull down on that lever and it'll advance the Westminster chimes once. Another item to uh, be aware of on the back is this cam mechanism right here. And you can activate this cam by the lever on the front. If you turn it one direction, it raises the pendulum up and that will speed the uh, clock up. You move it the other direction, that will lower the pendulum. That will make it slow down. And then for finer tuning, you can take the pendulum and just by turning this knob, you can raise the pendulum up slightly or lower it down slightly and you can fine tune it. That's another way of regulating the clock. Right now I'm going to pull this off of the test stand and I'm going to mount it in the case. So I've got the latch working real good on this door and I've also got that so it's not racking back and forth nice and solid. Let's get that movement installed. takes two fasteners on the bottom and then two fasteners on the top. So I'm ready to put the dial back on. I thought I'd go through a few things on the front of the clock before I close it up. This is the, uh, the chime side here. This is the Westminster side. And then this is for the time in the middle. And I'll just go ahead and run this around so you can kind of see how the front mechanism works. This will be the quarter hour. And the half hour. Three quarter hour. Now pay special attention to this pin on this cam. This pin is going to actually activate the chime for the hours. But it'll run through the Westminster chimes first. And with that, I'll go ahead and get the dial mounted on it. So the dial mounted up just fine. I was able to use the five original holes. And these uh, nail holes actually had two holes for each nail so that would indicate that somebody at one time or another had that dial off but it's time to put the trim on now put the dial and the trim went on just fine it looks much nicer than the scratched up one and get the hands on it
So one of the last items to finish up on this is Johan's is the knob for the door. Somebody has put in a screw. So I'm going to go ahead and fabricate a knob for it. So I've got a piece of brass I can turn down to make that knob. So this is a basic shape roughed out. I'm going to go ahead and take it off that mandrel now. I'll take it off this mandrel and then mount it on that screw. So I had this uh, piece of brass mounted on this mandrel and I mounted it with some super glue and I've just went ahead and heated it up a little bit and it released it now. So next thing I need to do is uh, I'm going to take this, since these th threads on the screw already fit that door, I'm going to go ahead and turn the, the head down on the screw so that it friction fits into this knob. Okay, that's real close now. I'll take it out of here and use my staking tool and press it on there. So I've got this screw so it's really, so that it's fitting really tight. It'll, it'll be a friction fit in there. And then I've got a hollow punch on this staking tool. Press that in there. That'll make a lot nicer looking knob than just that raw screw on that door. So the knob is uh, down, we can go ahead and put that on. So everything turned out real good on this clock. It's keeping perfect time.